Today we are launching the Code of Conduct, not known for SASB Turning Club, but also for SASB's Jubilee Club and SASB's Bobby Club. We ask you all at least to put your heads together and give a true cock and SASB welcome to Mr. Lee Sheedy. Thanks, uh, Ty. As I said, I'm uh, delighted to come along tonight. Uh, John is a good friend of mine uh, from, from the, the banking world and uh, we keep each other company there every now and again. But, uh, I don't know, there's something about every time I come to Cork. I don't know, we always seem to get a hammer because the last time I was down in Cork was the Wednesday after we played the match in 2010. I remember I was doing a presentation to a group of Cork branch managers here in, in uh, one of the hotels here in Cork. But I'd sit down my slides anyway, whenever it was set up, and I went down and uh, I thought the first slide, and I hit the clicker, and the next thing they all started laughing. I don't know why they all laughing. I turned around and opened, this, opened the first slide. Pat O'Regan had uh, Cork 315. Temporary 14 points. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am again tonight, and you're after being the lad again, last week again, below the game. So I think I'll have to stop coming down to Cork. It's, uh, it's definitely not good for us. But uh, no, listen, I, I think um, obviously I've read through the document. Um, it was sent out to me there on the email. And uh, I'm just going to take, give you my slant on things for, for 10 or 15 minutes. If anyone has any questions at any stage after it, I, I, I'd happily take them. Um, but as I said, it, you know, it is amateur. Um, both from a player's perspective and, and anyone that gets involved, it's, a, it's an amateur organisation. And for that, like, it does require people to put up their hands. Um, and when you look at the club, you know, there's a few facets to me that makes the club. Um, and the first thing really is, is the administration. I mean, administration is hugely important, you know. I mean, if you don't have your, your chairman, your secretary, your PRO and all the people coming together to organise exactly and set out your stall, you really don't have anything to build on. So like, the first thing I think is administration. Second thing is facilities. And a challenge in terms of the facilities is, is this facility have enough green grass to keep the club vibrant over the next five, ten years? And that's all the time what you've got to be looking at. And all the time ensuring that you have the facilities that are at a level that encourages young kids and adults to come in and play the game and choose the game that the GA, that, that the GA has. So I think the facilities are hugely important. And I think in terms of that then, you know, one that's very important is fundraising. It is about understanding what can you do creatively, you know? The times have changed and you've got to be very, very smart in terms of your fundraising. But you've got to ensure that your fundraising, that's led by your administration, any committee that you set up, allows the club to invest. Because if you don't invest in your club, your club will stop developing. It's as simple as that. Whatever you put into your club, you'll get back. So they're the first three things I was covering off just in terms of, I suppose, the the facilities, uh, the administration and, and the fundraising. And then I suppose you get down to where the real core, act, the core activities are in the club. And I, the first one is, is, is the coaches. And like hurling is a very, very technical game. And that hurley, if that hurley is sitting up there and they end up hitting themselves or hooking themselves, they won't come into the field that often. So as an underage coach, you've got to understand that the tool that the kid has is the right tool for him. And that when he gets it and he puts it into his hand, he can generate a source of enjoyment out of it and he can force himself to laugh and run and do all the nice things. And when he gets into the care uh, with, with the parents, that he says, God, Daddy, you know what, or Mammy, I can't wait to come back to the field again on Tuesday night for training. So I wouldn't underestimate the role of a coach in terms of your game's development. It's hugely, hugely important. And like, you have to plan and prepare the session that you want to run with your kids and making sure that they really enjoy what you're putting through. And as I said, you know, I see sometimes where you see young kids be doing laughs and laughs and laps to the field. All kids want to do is get that hurley and they'll run wherever you want them to go to chase that ball down. So encouraging all the time at underage, where do they get the enjoyment from? They get the enjoyment from the hurley, from the ball, and playing that ball and hitting that ball as often as you possibly can. And so I would always encourage anyone that's in the coaching space, the club will be as successful as the coaches and the effort that the coaches put in. Sure. That if you're involved with the team, upskill yourself to make sure you can run those training sessions that you're there on time. If you have a training session at half six, you should be in there at ten past six, and then the kids will be ready to go for you at half six. If that's the standard you set for yourself as a coach. So anyone here that's involved in teams, set very, very high standards in terms of your coaching structure and what you have in place. And ask yourself all the time, do those kids enjoy that session? And are they going to look forward to coming back into the field next week or next week tonight? So the coaches have a huge role to play in terms of the development of the club. And I suppose most importantly of all, at the end of the day, you can have the clubhouse here, you can have the field, you can have all the coaches in here. It is all about the players. 
You know, it is really all about the players. And how do you ensure that every year players will continue to come in that game? So you've got to ensure that the structure is in place that makes these players absolutely enjoy what they do. So making sure that, that you know, as, a, as an under-12 team, I, and I always say it at home, like, how many under-12s had we last year? We had 20. Right, how many have we started this year? We have 19. Who's the one that's gone? Where's he gone? Why did he go? Has he not enjoyed it? What's happened? Because there must be a reason. You've got to understand. And like it's too late, and, and you know, we all know the critical age between 16 and 22, where you start to see this drift off. And I know there's players that played with me when I was 18, 19, and they gave up the game. And I talked to them now. And what did I have? Regrets. Massive regrets. Because I don't think they realised at the time the enjoyment and the friendships and everything you get out of the game of hurling. But it's too late looking back. So making sure that you invest everything you possibly can in your players and your player structure. Because whatever you put into the players, you'll get it back in space. And there's an onus and, an, and a, a responsibility on the players that they give and they respect exactly what the club is trying to achieve. And there really is no place for people like, if you want to be successful, you won't do it by coming at anything half-hearted. You know, so for the player, like, I suppose it's, it's really a two-sided effort, really. Like the club has got to say, well, I've invested in you, but the part of the bargain is that as players, we're absolutely going to put our shoulder to the wheel, and we're going to be the very best we possibly can. We're going to get out of our comfort zone, and we're going to make sure we're pushing ourselves to the absolute maximum. Because as a player, you want to get the best out of yourself. Now, you shouldn't play the game of hurling to go through a comfort zone for the next 10 or 15 years. You should all the time be looking to get the best out of yourself. So, I suppose that's, in essence, where I would see the whole team coming together. And, like, the whole team moves together. If you don't have your facilities moving, if you don't have your administration right, if you don't have um, your, your, your coaches in a good space, and if you don't have your players enjoying what to do. If any one of those staff to slip, one impacts on the other, you know? They're like the four wheels in the car, they've all got to move together. The bulk of that is going to come from parents and adults taking a genuine interest in starting this GA club. Like, that's what's required. And I mean, people, I often meet people in my own club, like, they say, God, I've never coached a team. That's fine. We have loads of work in this club. We have loads of committees to be set up. You know, some, there are some people in my parish that are hugely successful business people that could play a starring role in the administration of the club. And it is about trying to get them involved. So don't underestimate the role you can play in the club, irrespective of how big or how small. You know, there's roles to be played, and every role makes the difference. It's all, if you get all the little things right, the big things look after themselves. To me, there's, there's a few characteristics that always you know, land with me when I see high performance. I'm always wondering what makes them tick. Um, like one of the things that, sit, that, that strikes me all the time is they set really, really high standards. They set very, very high standards. And I suppose the challenge all the time is deliver a standard that even though some people thought that wasn't in you. you know? I think you've got to set very, very high standards for yourself. So as a manager of an underage team, as a player on a, on a minor team or a senior team, set yourself very, very high standards. You know, don't be happy with the, the middle of the road stuff. Set yourself really, really high standards. Aim high. Aim high all of the time. It does make the difference. The other thing is positivity. You know, the one thing as a, as a country that annoys me is the amount of negativity we bring. I mean, I have loads of people that told me to start from last year, you waste your time going back. They didn't want trade for you. They didn't want to be. Oh, they'll do nothing. And they'll be blowing the bet. And when you're winning our final, they'll be blowing ready to bet the back off you. You know? Amazing people. You know? But all they think is negativity. Energy sappers. You know, and really and truly, if there's one thing that you need to be in life, it's positive. You have to be positive. Having a sad outlook on life will not get you anywhere. So being positive about your club, being positive about your team, being positive about your players, being positive about your kids and what they can do. You know, for a, for a young kid to flourish, they need seven positives to one negative. Now how often, how many times have we walked into a field with kids and tell them, don't do that, don't do that, don't, you're doing that wrong, don't do that. And all, all the time, you're just burying their confidence, taking away their belief, taking away their confidence. Encourage, encourage, encourage. Because no child comes in to make a mistake. Give them seven positives. Well done, well done, well done, well done, well done, well done. You could do that a little bit better. Well done, well done. And if you keep driving home that message, I would just say positivity as a coach, make sure you're staying positive. Because it's the positivity that works. It really is the positivity that works. And like the other thing is, you know, all the time looking to take action. I mean, talk is cheap, folks. You know, talk is cheap. I mean, it's very easy to sit here and, well, we'll do this and we'll do that and we'll do the other. But it's actually out there between the white lines and outside and committee meetings taking the step to say, I'm going to do this and I'm personally going to take this on board. 
it really does come down to action. So what can you do? What action can you take to make sure that, that uh, Sarsfields Club are as successful and continue to be as successful as they have been over the last number of years? Because, I mean, so I just encourage you to grab what you have. You clearly have something working here. Grab what you have. And I think the Code of Conduct is an excellent idea. Because what it's asking every one of you here tonight to do is to buy into what the club is trying to achieve over the next number of years. Buy into it. Whether that's as a parent, or as a player, or as a coach, or as a supporter. But everyone has a role to play for the girls and the boys with supporting that code of conduct. There's nothing in there that anyone can disagree with. Nothing. And I think it's a, fa it's a fabulous starting document, and it's going to be followed up soon, obviously, by the, by the coaching manual. Yeah. So like, I know there's a lot of people talking, as I go around, I've seen a good bit about five year plans. I'd always say to everyone, every, anyone I was ever involved with, I always work off a one year plan. So to me, it's all about a one year plan. And if I have five one year plans, that makes up a five year plan. Because often you're talking, I have a five year plan, we're hoping to win something in three years. But I guarantee you, it will not in the first two. You know? It definitely won't win nothing in the first two. So I always say, let's get as much as you can out of, out of the year. You've had a fab, as I said. Thanks a million. I'm delighted to come along tonight. Hopefully, there's one or two things that might help, either as a parent or as a coach or as an administrator. And if there's any questions, I'd have to take. All right? <laughs> But what do you reckon the uh, prospects of getting Kenny out of it over the next number of years? Set a very high standard. You know, and I, it's like like anything. I mean, the challenge for everyone is to get up there with them. Um, they set high standards for themselves. They love their hurling. Um, you know, and, and they've like you know they've won six of the last seven, so it speaks for themselves. The best team probably ever ever played a game. But they're passionate about the hurling, and I think you know that's why. You know, when you get that buy-in and like you don't see egos, you don't see, you know, you don't see anything that would be saying it's all about me or it's, it's all about the team and the team wins, everyone wins and like they're a special group and I think um, that's what can be achieved when you get people buying in. But you be, you know, look, some of them are, there's, a, there's a tree starting to come in front of a lot of their ages, so you'd be hoping maybe that <laughs> the day might be coming soon, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair play to them. Fair just, uh, on the last week before the championship match, just what kind of routine you, you would have had? Yeah, you probably said the word that's most important there, which is routine. Uh, we have a routine. Uh, you know, Thursday night would be fairly fiery now, before a match on a Sunday. Um, it would be, we, we generally play a bit of a match. I mean, my viewpoint all the time is that if you think you're tired, you'll be proven right uh, every time. Uh, no doubt about it. I've never seen that be proved wrong yet. Um, I, I do feel for some young guys that are asked to play maybe on 11 or 12 teams because if one manager isn't talking to the other, I mean, he should only be doing physical preparation with one team um, and, and the rest should be should be the hurling and, and uh, doing the drills, etc. But no, as I said, you've got to taper it, you know. But my motto all the time, I do five weeks on, one week off. It's how I run it um, with an adult team. So in other words, we do five weeks load, one week unload, but generally how level so Everyone's looking for the next level and I think you know, even there's GPS going in the back now to see how many miles to cover and the whole lot. So I really don't know where it's going to be. But at the end of the day, it's a simple game. I mean, I'd say the most successful team we spoke about earlier, they puck it out, they catch it, and they put it over the bar of the far end, the rest they put it into the back of the net. And that's it really, isn't it? Yeah, you know. What's the number one thing you do to make sure all the kids are motivated every session? Always have a match with kids, you know, because that's... <laughs> That's all they do. that's all they want. And I know they might run everywhere and everywhere, but at the end of the day a child wants to run. You know? Probably in the camp where up to under fourteen I wouldn't have I wouldn't have competition. Because I think, you know, we're all if we're a manager our, our objective is to win top the under fourteen. Maybe the best thing to do is make sure all the turkey are getting a fair chance to play the game of hurdle. I'm saying this for me, it's not about competition between ten and fourteen, it's about participation. Yeah. And participation is number one for me. Um, at that age group and trying to make sure you keep everyone coming because you know I'd like now Corbett never played minor for Tipperary Correct. fact you know I mean that story can you know like that and that's that's what can happen I mean we can't have late developers and six months and 16 year old can change overnight shoot to the top of the right hey guys could I just on behalf of everybody here and um, sincerely thank you for making it we have to come down here tonight I personally felt I think you all agree that that address was absolutely Effortless and inspirational, I thought it was absolutely outstanding. Could you put your hands together?